Oh, I'm going to miss Your feet are in my way. Sorry, baby. I will bang it on you, you're leaving. If we do this, though, it looks more professional. Well, if we just have a little bit of footsie on the table. Mm -hmm. just don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is getting deleted. <laughs> Start again. Can't wait to get sued for that. Yeah, okay. Hi, I'm Phil, Chartered Architect and Director at PWS Architecture and Design, Northeast based architect studio, and this is my intern, Theo. Hello. Welcome to episode two of season one of Back to the Drawing Board, where today we're going to talk about the pros and cons of going to university versus doing an apprenticeship. I guess the, the way to start this is just by literally going through what the processes are. Okay, so you've got you've got two main routes of qualifying as an architect in the UK. Um, your first route is going through university. You've got your part one, which is typically three years. Then you take a year out uh, for your work experience and then do another two years as a master's and the final year, part three, yep. which will be usually your seventh year and then you can qualify as an architect. If you do it as an apprenticeship, it's exactly the same amount of time. You do it in two parts. There's a level six apprenticeship and a level seven apprenticeship. So the level seven covers the part two and the part three. And the level the level six apprenticeship only covers the part one. So the part one being so your bachelor's the first three years. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the more traditional route is probably the, well, I suppose the, the more traditional route that we're commonly sort of spoon fed is mm -hmm. to go down the university route i know obviously when i wanted to be an architect it was you've got to go to university um i mean currently in the uk there's only two viable options in terms of your uh, level six yeah. apprenticeship which are based down in is it portsmouth Lon and south bank south in london bank, yeah so from here it would be it would be a minimum i think seven hour journey once a week for me to <laughs> for me to get there. Hence why you're abandoning me to go to university. Go to Glasgow, where uh, I can just stay. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting why so when we started looking into it, the differences between the two, obviously one of the major pros of going to university is kind of getting out there and kind of gaining your independence. Literally going to university. Yeah, exactly. I mean obviously <laughs> not, not necessarily to do with the benefits of the course, but the benefits of being away. Yeah, I mean, I know when I first entered university, I was definitely a lot more kind of reserved, a lot more shy. And spending that, that first three years in particular, kind of finding my own feet. I, obviously, I moved from, um, in case anyone doesn't realise, I moved from uh, Leeds in West Yorkshire up to the northeast to Newcastle um, to do university. And that whole sort of experience of changing where I was kind of brought out a lot of different things. And kind of finding my feet in the world. Yeah, was, yeah. It was really important. I think that's probably one of the things that... A lot of people, particularly in the UK, when they talk about you know, university lifestyle, but they also talk about gaining that level of independence, which you're not going to get if you stayed at your parents' house. Yeah, and as well, like, I know for me, um, 19 years of living in the same small village in the northeast of England, I'm ready to get away from, from here. <laughs> yeah, and a bit of city living, I suppose. Yeah, Is exactly. That, so exactly. I come from, a, um, where I'm from was like a little village, and it was a total change of pace to move into, because I mean, Newcastle itself, I don't know what Glasgow, well, I do know what Glasgow is like, but... Newcastle itself is so condensed. As a it's a very small city. Yeah. So I'll be moving somewhere significantly bigger. It's massive. Yeah. Glasgow's massive, but beautiful, which I suppose is important, especially yeah. when you're going to study architecture. <laughs> yeah, it helps. That's probably why Bath's so popular, isn't it? Just because yeah. it's got good buildings. Yeah. I mean, and, and also it's good. Yeah, I guess that's the first main thing about what's good about university is that you can actually get away. You can experience that independence. But that's the main thing that everyone will tell you no matter what you want yeah. to do. Because, I mean, I suppose that's that's not course dependent. That's not an architecture yeah. course-based thing. That's just that's university in general. University. Yeah. yeah. I think the main the main first thing with university is kind of having having those other people in the same position of you, as you and having like your, your kind of weekly reviews where they're going to challenge you because that's, that's going to give you a lot of chance for like creative development, having a big group of people kind of looking at your work saying, why have you done this? You know, I like what oh, yeah, you've done this. Whereas certainly while I've been working with you, any development, the, the opinions I'm getting are just yours. Yeah. And it's like kind of that's, that's what I'm learning. I'm learning about what Phil likes. Well, yeah, to a degree. I mean, obviously, it's more of a, it's less of a kind of, you must do it this way. It's more yeah. of a, that's never going to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's like, it's like, I, I don't hear about why people like certain things 
certain design aspects that I hate and then why other people do like them I hear about I mean I've why. tried to convince you that brutalism is nice <laughs> it's yet to work I think that oh, what's the what's the German guy called he's not German but your book's in German he's from Japan I think Tadayo Ando yeah he's he's the he closest a lot thing you've got to yeah. make me consider brutalism <laughs> there's, there's definitely been some interesting stuff but in the uk it was done really poorly yeah and they've all 70s. started to, yeah, they've all started <laughs> to fall apart i think you know how uh, i mean the other, uh, sorry i was just thinking and um, the other thing obviously with the university side is oh right you we mentioned yeah the yeah. whole subject of the episode I mean, yeah yeah you were talking about that you have like weekly reviews mm. in in strathclyde university do you have weekly reviews involving the students because when we do when we did ours when i went to northumbria um, you would do your kind of weekly re- review was one to one with the tutor. Yeah, so and you I, would live in the studio space, mm. and that's when you would get your feedback from your friends. Yeah, so, so from what I've been told about about the course I'm about to go on to, about the the Strathclyde course, is you kind of you present your project to the tutor with everyone else watching. Right. So I'm not I'm not entirely sure how the kind of the feedback works there. Um, my assumption is you know everyone feeds back i know certain places i did i did a interview for reading and it was a group interview and it was literally they just asked us to comment on each other's work and it's clearly mm. like when i've read through course details just such a big part of it is that kind of interaction between students talking yeah. about what they like and what they dislike about each other's work see we had that we had something similar to that um once or twice a semester as like an interim right. and then a final review where you would have you would pin everything up on the wall you would do a full presentation to your tutor and then you would have kind of a a moderating tutor as well mm-hmm. and then your peers from your tutor tutoring group would be there as well yeah so we, we had something similar but i suppose it was not as not every week there's a lot of in studio work as well. I know that yeah. about Strathclyde, and I, I assume it's similar most places. Certainly, I know you, you kind of get with university. You get two types of, of course. You get the the really creative kind. Not well, obviously they're they're all creative, but you get the the kind of more practical courses, and then the more written courses. Yeah, I know, um, Cambridge for example, which is usually in a battle with Bath between the top two universities. Yeah. It's a really written course. It's a really theoretical course compared to Strathclyde, which I know is very much like build us these model shows, develop yeah. your kind of creative side. Yeah, and that's that's what led me to go to Northumbria mm-hmm. was that that element of it. Mm. Um, yeah, I, mean, I suppose that's. Uh, I suppose it's going to work well for what you want to do. Obviously, whilst we've been here, we've been trying to kind of get the basics of using the software, yeah. understanding regulations, understanding sites, understanding how buildings work and function. Um, and that's giving you a good base to go out into the world and kind of experiment then with the style. Obviously, it's something that we work on here as well. Because I think, for, yeah, particularly at university, uh, when, we, when I started, one thing that they asked us to do a lot of was like experiment. And you find that they'll show you examples of other students' work mm-hmm. and you'll look at it and go, wow, that's, that's, that's amazing. And sometimes you'll realize, as I did, the watercolors are just not your friend. Yeah. Someone did an amazing watercolor of this building. Like um, They must have drawn it as like an axo. It was like an axo with a site and everything, and the building was there. And they painted it in, in watercolors, and they had like little people and trees, and it was beautiful. And then I just butchered my attempt at it <laughs> and immediately <laughs> put it down. But at the same time, that's valuable because it, it gives you that opportunity to, to just look at these things and, and go, I like doing it this way. I don't like doing it this way. It gives you a chance to be creative. And again, this, uh, this mate I was talking to who's on that course already was saying one of the most valuable things you can do is just try everything. Yeah. And even if it's crap, you know not to try it again or, yeah. you, or you can look at it and go, actually, that could be worth developing well that's it because you'll explore as well as it's sort of techniques you'll start to explore maybe styles of architecture yeah. and and the other thing with university is i mean yes there is a there's, there's an element of it having to work and function as a building and look correct and not fall over and kill anyone yeah but there's there's no kind of pressure for it to be at a hundred percent compliable design because 
chances are it's never going to get built. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's one of the best things as well about university is... You don't have to totally fixate on, is this building safe? Yeah. You you can think about the, the, the really more... Um, artistic aspects yeah. of it because obviously you'll, you'll get guidance as you go on like you need to put a handrail on that mezzanine yeah. and <laughs> things like that but obviously yeah. <laughs> this is i wouldn't want to walk into that or fall into that no it's definitely it's getting changed as soon as i am humanly able to <laughs> change that and, and yeah but you'll find that you obviously you'll get the guidance like that for the things that kind of make sense or oh, that yeah. staircase is far too steep but you'd probably be able to get away with like a 20 meter cantilever if the mm. rest of the building kind of makes sense that way and there's and that's the that's probably where the main first difference comes in with the apprenticeship is because you're working on actual projects or you'll probably be working on actual projects they have to work mm. and so it can take away from that uh, creative side and and add to that more kind of you know i wish i could have a big dome here but it's too expensive and it wouldn't physically work. Yeah, I mean, the other thing as well, I suppose, is the briefs at university, there's a lot more kind of leeway yeah. there. Yeah. You're very, it's very prescribed in the real world, um, particularly in kind of a residential setting. Yeah, if the client doesn't like it, you're not designing it. Yeah, if the client says to you, I don't want it to be have a flat roof, I don't want it to be clad in zinc, I don't want it to be brick, it already rules those things out. Yeah, and it, it limits that creativity. Yeah. Um. And also, I guess another limit from the from the development aspect with apprenticeships is if you're in a developed office, an office that's kind of you know, it's it's been it's been there for a while. They they know what they're doing. They know which techniques they like. Obviously, you've been here for a, a few years. Yeah, you're still working out kind of which methods you want to use. But if you go to a an office where they know what they like, it's not going to be like it, it's they're less likely to be like okay, we want you to practice for watercolors because they know you're never going to use it. Yeah. Whereas that's not the point in, in the first three years of university. It's not about going, you're probably never going to watercolor a house for a client. It's about going, how does this make you view mm -hmm. that particular project? Yeah. So one of the main pros I see of an apprenticeship is, is getting paid. Yeah. I know that a lot of people, particularly at university, um, it's particularly in the first year of university when I think it kind of got thrown at them. Here's your, you know, here's your grant money and here's and what you need like, to live on. I've got nothing. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of the, a lot of people struggled in, especially in part one, um, mm. or really in the first year. And all, especially with architecture, considering the, the extortionate prices of the materials that you have yeah. to buy pens paper i mean we had to pay for printing i don't i'm sure what it's like at strathclyde but i think so yeah yeah in um, northumbria we had to pay for our printing and when also wood card anything yeah. anything you're using for modeling and i mean I, I know specifically at strathclyde they're not particularly strict but you, you certainly said at, uh, at newcastle when it came to that kind of thing it was very much like we want you to do it our way so you've got to pay to do it that way. Yeah. So in Northumbria, in the first year, we had no. Tr we weren't allowed to use um, the computers. Laptops. It mm. was you. You have to do it by hand. Now, some of us, and I won't name names here, but some of us would draw it on a computer. Some of us were smarter. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then trace it. But it, a lot of that was kind of techniques on learning how to use. Um, like line weights and things like that and kind of understanding plan section elevation axonometric isometric all that kind of stuff yeah um but obviously the the massive con at university is you you're paying for that money. and you're getting very little money and yeah. you've got bills to pay rent you know you've got to get your job on the side and then you want to be going out socializing yeah well a lot of us a lot of them didn't work to be fair it's a very intense course yeah very intense and i think it makes it quite difficult to do a part-time job. I mean, I know I did zero hours whilst I did my master's. It certainly makes it even harder to kind of balance your books in a yeah. way, I guess. I don't think a lot of people ended up, at, well, everyone I know at university, unless their parents were like chipping the bits, was in an overdraft by the end of it. Yeah, I mean, if I if I actually get my overdraft, I'm going to be in it very quickly. <laughs> Shouldn't have left. Should not have left. Um, but I suppose the other thing as well... Just keep paying me. <laughs> I suppose the next massive pro to the apprenticeship side of things is the kind of the quality of experience. It's in first hand okay, yeah. real world experience. I've been working as an intern in a firm, obviously with you, designing buildings that are getting built for one year. And I mean what you've been sent projects by people who finished their masters, looked at it and thought, My intern can do better. Yeah. And it's with with one year of being on the job. I have learned so much. I, 
I could go off and design a really crap house much better than, <laughs> than people with with the full university experience. Yeah. And and having that experience of actually knowing how to make something real is really important when you're working in the real world. Yeah. I mean obviously <laughs> I mean I obviously I did my, my three years and then I went to do my one year out and I think in the first sort of three weeks I learned more than I had in the previous three yeah. years. And it's not to say that obviously university's not got its place but, but I think that's it that's the that's the significant difference in the style of learning but in in the first three years certainly yeah. that's the difference between the apprenticeship and university is university is so heavily based on the artistic side yeah i mean i suppose in a way you kind of and you got lucky but <laughs> you were you, you ended up here where you had the freedom to be creative with kind of the way that the building was obviously mm. you know jobs like the one in ash village where you you had you was confined by permit development rights yeah but you managed to make something creative and beautiful out of that yeah there's still that element of creativity but it's kind of using the softwares that i suppose we i'm familiar with using so that i can teach you the best way to use them yeah because if i if i was on revit which we don't use all of our episodes curse, <laughs> curse, that's a cursed word in this office <laughs> there's nothing wrong with it it just I just don't agree with it. I I've just unbelievably lost my train of thought. So if if you're trying to teach me on a software you don't understand, then that's not really going to work. Yeah, it's, no one's going to get anything out of it. It's like an English teacher trying to tell someone how to do maths. Yeah, you know, it's if if you if the person teaching it doesn't know. So that's why you know the person the master, <laughs> the person who's got the apprentice is going to be showing you the methods that they understand because they're going to be showing you the methods they can explain yeah and i think one of the things with that was i don't know we spoke about this was taking that as the base level to then experiment yeah. artistically once you've kind of nailed getting things right in terms of form layout plan you can then play about with the fancy bits yeah exactly. and then obviously that leads into the better presentation stuff that you can put in front of the clients yeah and on that note as well i suppose the other massive benefit is learning the process and kind of understanding where we sit within construction you know, we're kind of the overseer. The middle. Yeah. <laughs> we're kind of the middleman between everything, particularly in this studio. I know that a lot of other practices will just do like, here's your concept. We'll put it into planning. Here are some... Let everyone else. Here are some details. Yeah, so I know um, a lot of a place where I had, I had my work experience, it was they'd, they'd do the plans and then on certain projects, they'd send it to a contractor who would then be kind of... Deal so they'd be they'd send it to like a project manager yeah. who would then deal with the um the engineers and the builders but then oftentimes through through that week i just hear someone shouting getting annoyed about the, their, their uh, project manager yeah. who's just totally messed up <laughs> so yeah i mean <laughs> and it just adds an extra that extra element of confusion whereas if you are in the middle you yeah certainly, you, you know what's going on well that's one of the main things what we sort of try and sell ourselves on is being the middleman between everyone kind of taking as much stress away from the, the client, client as possible and obviously we deal with the planners will deal with engineers building control project managers contractors subcontractors blah 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 specialists yeah um and it's kind of it's a more traditional role i think as, as an architect is kind of sitting in that middle zone between everyone i mean the original so architect actually means master builder um so you would have been like you know part of that trying not to make a lego movie reference <laughs> as, as his uh, yeah. son's little and it lies broken on the floor <laughs> but yeah it's, it's kind of and the other thing is that you've you've experienced and you've seen projects getting built yeah so in the, in the past year we've had an opportunity i think you've seen sort of three or four of them kind of come up from the ground yeah. and genuinely when I was at university as part of one of our um, submissions at the technology you know section of, of you know so you'll do your design section you'll do your technology section you'll do other bits like that it was we had to draw a diagram of how it would get how this building that we proposed would get built and someone started by saying they would build all of the walls dig the foundations pour the foundations and then hoist the walls up <laughs> which in prefab kind of if works but if yeah, it's being but, made in a factory not if it's being made on site <laughs> yeah. it's a bit weird but there were some other things like that where they had yeah and <laughs> obviously in the real world you probably know how it's going to go down is going to be 
a lot of if there's going to be something prefab it'll probably be in the factory rather than on site and you know that if it's going to be built out of say masonry your chances are your foundations are going in first yeah. to build your masonry onto it, or your pads are going in for your steel frame pads are going in for your timber frame mm -hmm. things like that and it's it's that process and that understanding of actually the electrician will come in at this point the plumber will come in at this point this is when this will get connected this is when the roof goes on yes yeah. and you know understanding the importance because you'll have heard it a thousand times oh we need to get this watertight yeah because then you can get all the internal trades in and you understand that process now and it, whilst it sounds really logical when i say it like that and i suppose people listening to this that have experience will go well yeah obviously, obviously. <laughs> there is a point in i think a lot of people's um understanding where they don't actually put that sort of whole sequence together and it kind of when you hear someone say it if you don't understand it like that to begin with when you hear someone say it it would make sense yeah but if you'd never kind of had to think about it that way before and if you'd only ever looked at it it's just kind of i'm going to draw my walls i'm going to draw my floor i'm going to draw my roof you wouldn't really no one's ever told you the way it's going to work so you yeah. don't really know how yeah so um i guess one of the some of the cons of working in the apprenticeship apart from as we we've already mentioned the kind of limited number of people who are going to be reviewing your work yeah it's you know it's going to be your boss um yeah the other the other yeah, people would. in the firm if there are other people in the firm yeah. aren't really going to be checking your work because they're doing their own job so it's not like you've got an entire group of students. So so it's kind of, you're going to have a much more limited amount of feedback on your work. And then also, you kind of only really, certainly I, I think you're only really going to be exploring um, or designing work that matches the size of the firm you're in or the kind of the ambitions of the firm you're in. So if you're in a firm that likes to do... Um, Res well mainly residential yeah you're going to work on residential you might mainly be working on smaller houses unless you're in a firm where they want to work on much larger houses and then you're mainly going to be working on larger houses if you're working in a commercial firm that say is really well known for designing churches you might just be designing churches and you, you might never look at a house or if you if you've got an apprenticeship in a really big firm you might be designing, I don't know, you might be looking at, because it's educational, you might be looking at the first floor of a skyscraper, yeah. which is obviously, you know, y you're never going to see the two extremes of it. That's see, what I think. See, now we're, that's where we've disagreed in our notes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because why, whilst I understand where you're coming from in that, obviously, I suppose particularly we'll use me as an example in where we say we do residential. Mm -hmm. We've got, you know, little jobs like the little you know, three by four meter box extensions or yeah. whatever, those little, and then with a little bit of internal reconfiguration. But then you've got new build, four yeah. bedrooms and, we've, and we've, more. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, we've got that that kind of scope where we've got, and I, I suppose I've kind of sheltered you from a lot of that. Mm. I've sheltered you a lot from kind of the huge things. Except yeah, because I, I wouldn't be able to hack that at the minute. Yeah, I mean, the I, one I, I gave you that. in Bishop Auckland, which was like wraparound extension, garage conversion, two-story extension, this, that, and the other. Those, that I thought you were going to do a piece of, but you did the lot of, which obviously, <laughs> kudos, yeah. well done, but... That was that was very much, and I think, I think that's where you get the experience from being thrown in at the deep end and going like learn this well that's yeah well when i started there was there was a few of us that all started at once in mm. this in this particular firm in fact one of the best was one of the better examples actually is probably um one of the summers i did a, i did a work experience uh, for three months somewhere else and it was a massive firm and there was quite a lot of us that all started just to do the summer mm -hmm. and you can tell when there's the sink or swim people yeah and there is always going to be that and it's going to come down to personality traits and this that and the other um yeah and some people would are just great at kind of following the lead and just executing and some people are great at being in the lead yeah and, and going, there's always going to be do, that this is what we should look at yeah, yeah. Or, you know taking the lead and going well i'm going to research what i need to research to get this job done but the other sort of if i can take it slightly backwards when we go towards you know talking about that experience and the, and the typographies of architecture that you'll do you know we've got actually a few commercial jobs yes mm. they're granted they're quite small and it's mostly interior design and kind of little bits of external and some you know some site work but the other thing is that we've started looking into doing is more competition work which yeah. are larger buildings so obviously there's that um, cinema and, pavilion in iceland and that they're we, commercial yeah and they're commercial and it's not that we're trying to get out of doing the residential it's actually just exploring 
the other routes. Yes, yeah. exploring the other routes and exploring kind of things that take my interest and take our interest. Obviously, if it had been a hospital or a university, I, it wouldn't interest me. Yeah. And obviously, with you leaving, I wasn't going to ask you if you were interested in doing it because you'd be gone before you actually got around to designing it. But oh, there's that opportunity to have a university. Yeah. Really? A university building? Oh, right. No. I thought, I thought you were talking about the pavilion. <laughs> oh yeah, that, yeah, that's gonna be exciting. But oh right, so it hasn't actually started yet. So we, yeah, no, no, it's tell so. Me when, tell me when it does, and I'll send you something. I've got started it. Have you? Yeah, yeah. The deadline's not until like December. Oh, awesome. Yeah, and but like I say, we've got that kind of, we've got that scope to take that on. And now I don't, I'm not gonna say that there isn't available elsewhere, but I don't think a lot of practices would give that opportunity to go. Well, here's a competition yeah. brief or. Do you want to... This is Phil saying, please apply for an apprenticeship. No, please, <laughs> please don't. If I've learned anything from having him for a year, it's that, no. <laughs> no, I don't... What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Well, I suppose one of the things we're both interested, well, I'm particularly interested in is kind of that development of the next generation of architects and yeah. helping where I can. But yeah, I think there's that opportunity with me in particular, and I think some smaller practices do, and some small and medium practices probably have that ability to be able to give you something else to look something at something from here something because we've got we have got a range that we can do and obviously there's the competitions but then other other firms where they're doing it might just be like actually this is what we do yeah and this is what we stick to and so i guess a big part of that is researching where you want to get your apprenticeship yeah in the same way that you would research where you want to go to uni yeah so that you know what your course is and you know yeah you know what you're getting yourself into because yeah. i think a lot of architects' practices do set themselves on a, right, this is what we do, this is how we're going to do it. And uh, I think it takes the excitement out of it. And for me, and I've been in jobs and I've done roles for years where it's like, it's just a monotonous grind. Yeah. And I've yet to feel that with working for myself, mm -hmm. probably because I get to call the shots, but also because I get to pick and choose some exciting jobs. You get to make sure you're doing something that you know yeah. it's going to be exciting. And it's and the that's, same thing with you when I've taken you to consultations and you've, you've got excited about a job, which I know to me means I'll maybe drop my fee proposal price down a bit so that we get it through the door yeah. and you've got something to work on that you're excited for. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. So I mean, I, I get where you're coming from and I think it might apply to the majority, but I think there's a minority of us that would probably give you that experience yeah. of a wider breadth of, uh, of topologies of architecture. Yeah. So I guess now we're on to the kind of the, the pros and cons of the oh, final well, four, no, three years. Well, we can lump together the part two and three. Yeah. Because I think the te most people tend to do them back to back, but mm. also your level seven apprenticeship is your part two and three. Yeah. So it, we'll just it, cover it, it as, one, as one section. Obviously, um, the, the main way, I think it's probably worth talking about how they work in your part two, that's your master's degree, you're still studying full time yeah. in your part three. Yeah, you're in uni about four days. Uh, it's a it's a day <laughs> or so, uh, got a few days a month. Yeah, yeah. You you rarely in university. You you work mostly for a practice. Yeah, <clears throat> it's it's really showing examples of the work that you've been on, the experience that you've had, making sure it ticks a lot of their boxes. Yeah, and then you know doing a lot of dissertations and then doing your mm -hmm. uh, oral exam at the end. Yeah, and then there's a, a so obviously between the the part one part two, you you take a year out, but that's a year of work experience yeah. that's they're not really checking over that as, as far as my understanding well you is. so you that's your opportunity to go work elsewhere yeah so well i mean obviously you, you do a sandwich I've course like you're, you're planning on doing where you go to a foreign country during the, uh, your part one so i don't think that counts towards it no it doesn't mm. as far as i know that doesn't count towards it is because it's part of your um, it's still part, it's part of, of the course. university course yeah. so if i do four years I'll still have to do my extra year out. Yeah. So when I did mine uh, all those decades ago, you left you left your part one, you worked for a year, and in that year where you worked elsewhere, that didn't need to be under a qualified architect. Most people did it under qualified architect. I did it under a chartered technologist. Mm -hmm. um, but you can also work in foreign countries at that point. And, right. And it will count towards everything else that you do. So most universities will expect you to have done a year out um, of work experience yeah um, and if you can say i did my work experience in brazil they'll be like oh yeah it's a bit more ooh, fancy yeah. but you get bougie <laughs> oh, but you get that kind of we've got a policy here at pws that if a client uses that word they are not a client <laughs> oh, painful i don't know what it is about that word um bougie. but it's it's oh, one God. of those um it's one of those things where you just need to get that year's worth of experience 
and have it obviously overseen by someone who's in a relevant industry. So yeah. when you fill in your PDRs, uh, which is a personal developer, so like a personal educational, de- professional educational development record. I can't remember what it stands for anymore. But when you fill in your PDRs, development records, <laughs> there'll be. <laughs> that's a that's a good example of. Um useless acronyms isn't it oh yeah it is pdr development records no it was pdr and then i was like actually just i'm going to call them development records from here on because <laughs> i'm just going to get it wrong um those those development records you'll have an option um for it's like a level one two three one being an architect registered in the uk and working with an architect in the uk two is working someone in a relevant field in the uk and then three i think is working for an architect in a foreign country or something along those lines um but you'll obviously you'll cover that as you go through. Um, and I suppose, obviously, in terms of the pros of doing your part two and three at university is that I mean, other than the fact that all of the previous ones apply. Yeah, everything everything from the part one. You know, you've got that um, independence independence of being at uni. You've got that feedback from your peers. You've got that artistic development. Yeah, yeah. You get all of that still, um, but it's a little bit more kind of technical. I wouldn't say it's well, fully... cer- certainly in the part three when you're working in office. You know, mm. then it's like you're designing buildings. Yeah, it's it, but that's a stay up. That's a totally different course to the master's course. Yeah, the part the part two master's course is still kind of it's almost like part one but on steroids. Because yeah, it's, it's still it's as it's still as brutal, more intense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you do you kind of have that you have a further knowledge and you probably will work on bigger projects. You know, and and some universities actually oppor- offer opportunities for real projects. So there were some mm-hmm. where I went to university where we were actually given is that real they, life briefs. The, the uni wins competitions and then gives it to the student, kind of. Sometimes, yeah. I mean, I know some or is it places go to the university say we want your students to try and design something. So, yeah, so for example, we had one which was, um, do you know the the sill? Nope. Okay. In Northumberland, <laughs> it's it's called the sill. It's by Hadrian's Wall. It's um, it's kind of a it's a rock formation, but we were given a live. I think it was the year before us were given a live brief and then a local architect was doing it as well and some other architects and I think one of the local architects won it. Right. Um, but the students' work was actually presented and they were given awards for it. Oh, okay. And we got the same brief and I think there were some student awards for ours as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but there were other elements of, of, you know, there's various ones going around and when I did, I did my master's thesis project and that, were, that wasn't a real life project but it kind of was. It's a bit of a long story but... In essence, we've got time. <laughs> <laughs> in essence, um, I spoke to someone who was actually interested in doing the project. It never actually came to anything, but I kind of used him to get a brief f- to guide the design of that building. Yeah. Um, it ca- it became apparent pretty quickly that it was never going to happen. The tutors were quite happy for me to carry on down the route because it was kind of we'd given a prescribed brief off someone, and actually, in the end, I did show it to him. Mm-hmm. And he was really impressed with it, which is good. But yeah, some universities, you might even get to do a competition project. Yeah. Some, they might not. Some of them might be prescribed. Some of it might be pick your own, which is what I got for my master's, my final year master's thesis anyway. But then so, something you mentioned earlier is what takes us into the cons of the part two and three is it is intense. Yeah, it, it, is, is. it was pretty brutal because you get... You, you do end, not sleep <laughs> I don't anyway. Um, but you get yeah, you kind of that. <laughs> you've got all of the bits of part one that we mentioned before, but you've got to throw on steroids. thousands of words of dissertations mm. and reports and things like that. So it's kind of developing that Oh, you're scaring me, man. Yeah. It's kind of throwing in that um at the academic side of things, so the ac- academic writing and things which yeah. you don't strictly use in practice so obviously we you'll do a lot of kind of formal emailing and formal report writing when you do heritage reports and things yeah would i be right in saying as well it's useful for applying for competitions because you've got to kind of write and say this is our firm this is why you should pick us when you do when you're putting your bid in yeah Mm -hmm. so but that's not quite academic writing but it's kind of it's that kind of formal way of writing and describing and you know and doing it that way but we kind of cover that when we email people really obviously when we talk it's different to how 
how we email people because you've got to have yeah. that professionalism and that's kind of that's I mean, what it got, is you, really you've got your voice with your builders your voice with your engineers which the engineer voice is usually from what i can tell angry <laughs> yeah it's usually shouting yeah. your voice with your clients which is usually try and remain calm and then your voice with your intern which is oh i can relax <laughs> oh you know i thought that one's usually more angry why is that there <laughs> But yeah, it's... why is the car in the living room? <laughs> hey, I've I've done that before. Where we we got so it, have I. <laughs> got, it, got in someone's car and turned it into a piece of furniture. I did it. I did it when I was doing my work experience, and the director was it was like, "Why is there a car?" And I, I just went, "I I couldn't find your your model of a pool table." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's obviously I didn't help myself by having a child, moving house and renovating a house, working. Uh, zero hours whilst doing my master's also starting my own business and then doing my in-laws house that was interesting yeah <laughs> it's a terrible <laughs> idea i don't know why anyone let me do it oh god but that was uh, yeah obviously i didn't, didn't help myself there but it's it's one of those things as well i think a lot of people probably struggled your time management's a lot better mine but no no, oh, no, 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 no. jesus you no know, yours is awful but i'm your time... still trying to manage my brain to stop going on a tangent about how we should put acoustic panel in over EDs. yeah definitely yeah because I'm, I'm listening to this echo we should just panel the entire thing yeah <laughs> just we turn do. my entire house into yeah, just a massive studio yeah. well that's the plan but the i suppose it was in terms of yeah. kind of time management people got better time management between part one and part two but because the level of intensity increased it didn't make much it difference. It didn't make much difference because you, the, if your time management skill was set to doing that 100% work and then you get 200% work, it's going it to take like double the time management. Holy Jesus. Yeah, it just throws you Help in at the us. deep end again. I mean, of course, the other thing is you will still have no money unless you work part-time. And yeah. quite a lot of people did. And I know there were people on my course who did a part-time master's course where they actually worked for another company and still did... Uh, the university and then i think that's probably the, the that's probably the line in between the apprenticeship and doing a full-time university course is doing the part-time but i think it took them like four or five years or something mad i'm just gonna have to eat as little as possible <laughs> you're gonna come back withered away yeah so kind of the size of a normal person yeah <laughs> i mean i suppose the other thing as well is it you become you're still kind of detached from the real world real well, architecture because you, you're locked in your room no, I mean designing designing skyscrapers that are five times the height of the Burj Khalifa. Yeah, winning, that's winning that's new rewards for designing something cool and eco friendly that realistically would just not be built. Yeah, and I think obviously when you go back into that university setting, unless you're working full time, you're never going to be working on a potential realistic. Unless you go, you know, like we've mentioned before, there are universities that offer courses for real projects, but yeah. most of the time they'll still be really out there. And probably won't get into that level of detail where they get built. Yeah, so you kind of still get detached in a way, but you've kind of got a little bit more realism within your yeah. kind of skill set, which I suppose helps massively. That's, yeah. So as part of your part three, as I think we mentioned before, is you don't spend that much time in university and you do yeah. work in conjunction with because you're using those real life examples and that real life experience. And you write that up in a lot of dissertations and a lot <laughs> of writing. But you'll find that that gets done as a kind of a side thing so you'll be doing it evenings and weekends basically yeah. if you're not already working evenings and weekends at the <laughs> practice um the other thing with that is you'll find that i mean some some do and some don't my the place i was working at offered me and said you know we'll pay for your we'll pay for you to do your part three oh. but in the end, I paid for it, and I can't remember why. There was a reason. Oh, the reason was... Didn't you quit or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, so he said to me, I will pay for it as long as you stay for X number of years. Oh, okay. Uh, once you've qualified to kind of recoup that money. And you realized you didn't like working there. Well, it wasn't It wasn't necessarily that. It was that I thought to myself, I would like to... I'd been there for five years. Mm -hmm. Or, well, I'd been there on and off for five years, I think. And I just thought... And I'd made myself... I was up at the top of the chain, really. I was kind of running the shop, and I thought thought to myself i'd go work i might try work somewhere else or i might a friend of mine was talking about starting up for himself and wanted someone to join in he wanted to do um he wanted to do basically commercial yeah and i wanted to do residential and so that we so kind of worked in tangent yeah. yeah um anyway so there was that was kind of the, that was the reason i ended up paying for it for myself but i know some firms actively make you pay for it for yourself yeah a few of my friends have kind of said well we had to be, even though some of them worked for quite large firms were told no, you've got to pay for it. And it's only a few grand, but wages and architecture aren't particularly great. Although, because you're still technically a student, would you not still get the loan for it? 
Mm-mm. No, you only get it for, I, your, for your masters and your. Industry. I don't believe I. I certainly wasn't offered, and I couldn't find any at the time I did mine. Okay. Um, so it was a case of either pay for it yourself or your, I, all the practice would pay for it. Yeah, because my my impression of it is that student finance will pay for the entire duration of your course, and as far as I was aware, level seven counts as part of your course. Yeah. Um, you pl- you, so you'll apply for a second loan when you yeah, get to I, master. I've so you got this for my undergrad. So if you can apply for another one for your um, your part three, just let us know because <laughs> I will be oh, I won't be angry actually because I was I was fine to pay for mine, <laughs> but yeah, it can yeah. be a bit of a pain in the ass having to do it that way. Yeah. I guess the next thing for us to mention is the level seven apprenticeship, which in my mind is just the right thing to do. <laughs> I, I, I think you, this is one of those things that you and I definitely agree on with like yeah. zero question, even if you had to drive down to London every week. I, I would not want to do a part two and three course at uni. I, I cannot understand why you wouldn't try and find an apprenticeship. Yeah. You get paid, you learn how to do the work, you've got almost a guarantee of a job coming out of it because the person who's employed you as an apprentice has put that money into you. They will want you afterwards, so they will almost definitely offer you a job. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that probably you, applies to you, doing the level six as well. You yeah. Know, but if I was to put you through all of this, if so, granted, I offered you a job anyway, but... Yeah. Even if, if someone I put was you to give the, you a level six, they'd probably give you a level seven as well. Yeah, they'd probably yeah. see you through the run. Mm-hmm. Um, whether or not that comes with any caveats of you must then work for me for a minimum of well, however many years afterwards. But yeah, there's also that kind of... Um, if you've done your part one of uni, you've had three or four years at uni, you've got that experience, you've got that debt. The, and the social, you've got that debt <laughs> yeah. as if it's a pro. Yeah. You've, <laughs> but you've, you've got that social skill. Yeah. And you've got that life experience and you've that kind out, of You've budgeting made your friends that. somewhere. You know, you've you've experienced a new city or the same city in a different way. Yeah. So you've, you've done all that. You're kind of, you're not going to be missing out on university. And, and the part two and three is so intense that you don't necessarily have all the time for it anyway. Um, yeah. So when you're doing your level seven apprenticeship, you won't be feeling like you're missing out. And then again, it gives you that three years of just the, the best method of learning. Yeah. And I know, again, referring back to that place where I went, I went and did my work experience, they had someone who'd done part one at uni and then a level seven apprenticeship. And he was, he was the youngest employee there and everyone who was like i don't know maybe maybe 20 years older than him considered him equal yeah be- because it's just that way he'd learned he'd learned to be clever he hadn't learned with the mistakes that uni can teach you you know he hadn't had to learn how to do how to use the software by himself he had been taught from the get-go how to correct yeah. design something and so he just came into it with the right knowledge <laughs> yeah and so kind of when you compare yourself after after the end of your level seven apprenticeship to someone who's done their part two and part three straight in a row you will be undeniably better unless you're at just the, at the job role at the job role you you will just be more efficient more practical if it, more it, employable i think is the key so bit. much more employable, yeah obviously the last few years so we're recording this in 2022 the last couple of years obviously we've had things like the pandemic where we've had lots of lots of act- architecture practices were sacking left right and center to try and cut costs to try and stay afloat a lot of places weren't hiring and having that baseline of this is what i can do and this is the skills i've got is going to help you massively get a foot in the door whether it's you know whether you decide to do your apprenticeship somewhere and then go into somewhere else you know if if contractually allowed to whatever or whether you stay in the same place you kind of built up that skill set that gives you the opportunity to go out in the world and actually do yeah the job anywhere i think that that's kind of the difference isn't it someone coming out of their part three is going to be saying hey this is what i can do and this is how ready i am to learn mm. whereas someone who's coming out of their apprenticeship well, will go this is what i have learned you come you come out you'd come out of your apprenticeship at the level seven as an architect whereas you come out of your level you come out of your part two as a master's of architect mm-hmm. and then you have to do your part three but you have to be working so that relies on you getting a job post masters to do your part three. Yes, and, so someone has to want to employ you, and it has to, to be it. a qualified architect to sign yeah. off your PEDRs so that you can be, 
become a qualified architect, which is obviously where I had yeah. a lot of issues. And obviously your, your level seven apprenticeship, it has to be done with, with an architect as well. Yeah. Um, but you've been, you're going to do it with them for three years. You're not at any point going to have to try and find someone else to, to work with you. Yeah. And I think the other thing as well, unless with, they really hate you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the university um, criteria, I believe changed not mm-hmm. too long before I did my part three, because I know that my former boss, the child technician, actually passed an architect before. So uh, at some point, there's been a change, and you know, there's there's that kind of opportunity there where someone might go, "Well, I passed someone before." They get them through the part three course to find out at the end that it didn't yeah. count, which is obviously what happened to me. Whereas to apply for apprenticeship, it has to be. Yeah. It has to be it's, ready it has, you because it's done through. It's done through the RIBA. Yeah, it's it? done through the RIBA. And the university of, of of your boss's choice. Well, I think you could kind of. Talk I'd, I think it I'd let you choose wherever you wanted, but yeah. So I, I the think the major benefit is with the, the the level seven apprenticeship is so many places offer it now, including yeah. Northumbria, Newcastle, which are you'd, you'd be hard pressed to not find to find a place that doesn't really do it. Yeah, within a like a I suppose a travelable distance, especially yeah. when you're not in you're not in five days a week. Yeah. Or seven days a week as we were when we were at uni. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. It's just, it, it just seems like the logical approach to take because yeah. you, you're getting paid, you know. Well, I mean, I've, I've gone through it, but it's just sensible <laughs> in my mind. Yeah, I you've, mean. You've got to learn all the same things because you're going through a university, technically. You've got to hit the points they want you to meet. So you won't be missing anything that the people doing their their part two and three will be doing you'll still be meeting all the same points that they are with that extra benefit of you're already doing the job yeah i mean you the i think the only key thing that i think you miss out on is that social aspect when i was at university yeah. there was a lot of kind of studio mentality mm-hmm. which is obviously something that i'm keen to kind of have within pws but mm-hmm. that kind of studio mentality of you know, pinning things up on the wall and your friends going around with a, a marker and that. You miss, you'll miss that. You'll miss a lot of that social development. Yeah. Um, but, but you've already, you've you, already got it. But I suppose the other thing as well is when you get more hands on at that stage and that level of your kind of career, you'll be the one talking to clients and you'll be dealing with different people within the industry. If you're in a big practice, obviously you'll have loads of peers. Yeah. Whereas in a smaller practice like this, you probably only speak to a few people at once, but you'll talk, you'll probably talk to more clients, more engineers, more builders, and you'll yeah. build up that kind of social skill there. And you'll have that day a week in university where you'll be talking to your tutors and your peers there. I know a, a lot of people are kind of nervous to, to do an apprenticeship because it's it's seen as the unconventional route mm. and you kind of look at it and you go, is it legitimate? You know, but it's, it is obviously. Yeah. Um, it's accredited and that's the important bit. Yeah. You, you can become a chartered architect at the end of. Well, you become an approach. architect at the end of it and then you can apply you to can, be chartered. Yeah. So it, it gets you to the exact same place that the full university course would. And anyone I've found who has an apprenticeship in architecture is really respected within their firm. Yeah. It's like some, someone at the same level, at the same age, with, with the same experience who hasn't had that apprenticeship, just is, isn't really respected in the same way, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of got that feeling when I left and came back was, oh, I've got to get you back up to speed again. Mm. Obviously, I suppose, on the note of the word respect, I suppose you were given a lot of opportunities in respect because we were small enough to afford that for you. So you were actually yeah. doing some practical jobs, but I know... Some practices, when you kind of start, the first thing that you'll do will literally just be, oh, well, here's a job we did a while ago, just design the extension, get used to the software, mm-hmm. learn but, how to be useful to us. So from what, I, yeah, and I guess from what I understand is if you're doing an apprenticeship, the person who's taking you on probably does care because okay. they're if they're willing to put the effort in to yeah. meet the criteria that the university wants, then they probably do care about actually making you a, like a really valuable architect. Yeah, a valuable so, member of the team, really. Yeah. Whereas if you just come in as just as an architect into some development firm, th- then it's more likely to be be useful to us. But if someone really, if someone wants to put that work in to get you qualified, then they they probably want you as as you yeah. say part of the team. I mean, you you see now um, a lot of the, you know, obviously with with me being on LinkedIn as a, I've obviously got my profile and I've got the business's profile, I get a lot of kind of recruiters and I get a lot of notifications and I get a lot mm-hmm. of kind of information on what jobs are around at the moment to see if I've got something similar going. And you see a lot of it seems to be an architect 
or maybe it might be a part two architect uh, architectural assistant or a part one architectural assistant and they'll expect you to have x number of years of experience yeah so they want you to have the experience before you even got you know into before the application job. Yeah, yeah before you even start applying they say you know we need you to have x number of year, years of experience and if you but that's where you need to get the experience from there yeah. so that you've got the experience to apply for their job it doesn't really make I, sense i want to me. come here to get experience but I need experience to do that. And it, obviously, if you've got your apprenticeship, you've got three years of experience from that, plus an extra year from your gap between your part one and then where you start that apprenticeship. So yeah. you've, you've already got your experience. Whereas, as you say, coming out of a full uni course, you've got two years. Yeah, and you've got to find the experience you've to get to, more experience yeah. elsewhere. So you've got to find someone who's willing to go, yeah, we'll give you the experience. Yeah. And... It's a, it's a risk thing, and I mean, I know spoke, speaking to my kind of my former boss, I know that I think the first kind of month or so, I certainly didn't run that much in terms of profit, mm-hmm. and that's a risk that the business has to take. I mean, obviously, I'm now talking from kind of an employer's and the master versus apprentice. <laughs> oh. So, someone please, um, in fact, Theo, cut in, yeah, the my apprentice. My apprentice. <laughs> please cut that in there. No, that would be like, um, I mean, as a kind of, as the as the person who's taking on the apprentice, there we go. Yeah. My apprentice. <laughs> my apprentice. As the guy, as the guy taking on the apprentice. Um, you should wear a, a hooded black robe. Should I go get it? <laughs> <laughs> I've actually got a bathrobe. Which is it's all black with the um, empire thing on it. It's got like a big, big hood on. Um, all right, I'll get a, a little. I'll grow a little um, rat's tail. Are oh, you gonna have to? Because you're going bald on top. <laughs> it's all you're gonna have. It's got to go somewhere. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, it kind of covering apprenticeship from kind of the employer's standpoint, because that's obviously where I best sit. Because that's what I that's am. That's what you are. Yeah, yeah, I'm the I'm the employer that offered you an apprenticeship. For me, it's kind of there's a great amount of satisfaction and I didn't realize this until you, it's probably until about kind of March this year, March, April, I think that was probably when we were doing um, the little extension in Esh yes. and um, some of the other projects were kind of getting a bit further developed in the building stage and you were asking lots of questions. Yeah. For me, that was really gratifying to see you come in on your first day and ask how you could plant a tree on a roof. To, <laughs> Which, oh, I, re- I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Which, to be fair... In fact, no, I think my first question was, uh, how, how do, how I, do make, I turn the computer on? How do I make on? a door? Yeah. But I mean... It, do, you remember, do you remember my first house with no windows? I do. Seeing you come from that all the way to, you know, you've done, you know, some really out there concepts for schemes, but also buildable concepts that clients have looked at and gone... That's I like a, that. I like these elements. I want that. Yeah. yeah. And I know that, you know, it, you, you'll always start at that kind of, I have no idea what I'm doing and you'll yeah. develop. And it's that development, I think, that's been really gratifying for me to watch. And that's what's made me excited to see what happens in the future. And also mm. that was what kind of forced me on the route of, I'll give you the opportunity to take on an apprenticeship if your A levels went to pot yeah, and yeah. you didn't end up getting into university. We'd be there to catch you. And I think as well, obviously, and I know this is a conversation we've already had kind of off camera, but it's definitely one of those things where we'd be happy to have you back because you've got that experience. Mm-hmm. And it was that kind of leads into what we were just talking about, about having experience <laughs> to get a job. Yeah, because like, cause I've had my, my year experience with you. You know that I'm valuable. Yeah. Whereas... Like if if I didn't valuable, get, yeah, or or certainly I have the potential to be. Whereas with a university, they haven't got any experience with me. So if I didn't get those grades I needed, they'd turn me down because they don't know. My it's a value. tick box exercise. Yeah, but I mean, I suppose if if I if I'd written you were, I mean, I did, I did this for Michael as well, who was not an intern but was kind of a contractor employee. I wrote him a letter for when he applied for a a place at a university spot to say you know he'd worked with us for a, a bit and he's done this that and the other and, and stuff and that was what actually clinched him the deal to get onto it and obviously really? if you'd maybe not got the a levels that you needed something like that might have helped who yeah. knows but obviously we don't have to cross that bridge because you've got in <laughs> so i know kind of in the first episode we briefly talked about the route i'm about to do but i guess in the grand scheme of things we can talk about what i want to do and so what, what i want to do is i want to do four years as my undergrad with my my sandwich year abroad 
because I know that would just be such a good experience. Yeah. Even even if like I didn't do much exciting work, it would be like having the experience of seeing the work being done in a, in a different country would be really good, especially because I'm not so keen on England. <laughs> I don't blame you. It would give me a chance to learn another language, which is fun. Um, and just, unless, unless you go to Canada unless or I go to, the USA. Yeah. Or, or, or most places Pretty in much the any Scandi country, because a lot of them speak English. <laughs> <laughs> or, or just any country. <laughs> yeah, I mean, English is the world's second language. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'd, I'd want to do that. Two, two years, sandwich placement, final year of my part one. Then get my year's work experience. And I mean, from what I can tell, I want to, certainly from my experience here and from what I've seen just in the world and in the world of architecture, I'm not too interested in kind of skyscrapers i guess and those yeah. those massive projects and from what i've heard about people's experiences working on those massive projects you're you unless you own this gigantic firm you're not the one designing the phallic symbol of a tower you <laughs> <Yeah>. know <laughs> you're the guy doing the and bathroom then, and parking yeah. layouts and then trying to name it in a way that makes people think that wasn't what you were thinking of <laughs> yeah and I think that's probably something that will obviously, I think as part of this, and I know we mentioned it in the first episode, is documenting that as well yeah. and kind of following you around because I think it would be great, especially if you did go to a foreign country, to see what the what their kind of, what their, not, not necessarily their regulations, but what their kind of process is and what yeah. their ethos is. I know when I did my master's, I did a lot of research and I've always done a lot of research into eco stuff. And that led me to a lot of the Scandinavian countries because they're so cold. They, <laughs> yeah, they, they put a lot of effort into yeah. things like that. Yeah. And so, a lot of natural materials and human well-being and things like that. And that's really, I think that's important to me. And it's what I use a lot of in my architecture. Yeah. Even at residential level. And that's it. And that's one of the things I know I like. Like one of the things I looked at was uh, um, if, if you search up earth ships. Yeah. Which <laughs> yeah. you don't agree with the name of because it's not a ship, but it is made out of the earth. Can I give it that? And, yeah, and the whole idea of it is it's this completely self-sustaining, off-the-grid uh, building. Mm. And it's it's made out of, like, uh, kind of mud cements and with tire walls that you found in yeah. the skip yards. And, you know, solar panels across the roof with, like, a wind turbine in case it's in case you're not in, I don't know, the, the middle of the USA in a desert, which is where I found this, like, this colony yeah. of them. <laughs> and I, I'm really interested in that, like, I don't know what you mean as well. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really interested in that kind of working on smaller projects but doing the majority of it and having a having a bigger say in it, which yeah. is why I really like working here. Well, that was why I ended up. So I did. I did a summer in a. Well, I did a. I did a few summers in some larger practices, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and the day I left uh, after being sat next to someone for three months, I, I stood up on my final day, turned off my computer, and was it was a bit of a moment of oh here we go, <laughs> and then the guy who was sat next to me the whole time turned and said, "Thanks for being here, Paul. <laughs> it was great having you." Jeez, and I was like, yes, man. I didn't even dignify it with a response. I just left. Yeah. <laughs> I'd sat next to him and he'd be my lead architect on a, it was a big, I think it was a hospital. We did, we did a few different ones, but the main one was like a hospital project. It was awful. I just, yeah. I, it, it seems like a lot of work without much satisfaction. And so that, that's kind of why I want, that's why I yeah. want to come back here. And it's why I, I know when it gets to doing my... A year out chances are i'm going to ask you for for that year and when it comes to signing to applying for finishing it i'm probably going to ask you for an apprenticeship yeah well that's obviously yeah. i mean i don't know i've offered that and said i'm yeah. more than happy to do it that way and i think the question is in the next three years will my opinion change yeah. and hopefully the answer is no because if it does then i'm i'm thinking wrong <laughs> <laughs> well you'll i think you'll experience a lot of things and it might change your mind and obviously that we'll Fear, document that and we'll have that sadness. chat um, yeah brokenness brokenness yeah. but i think emo emotionally physically yeah. mentally financially yeah. <laughs> but i think <laughs> i think it's going to be a, a, an interesting thing to watch as you kind of progress through things i think the other thing and this will be something that we probably cover with some other people that we'll talk to the people that have either maybe it's people on your course or people that did my course where you don't necessarily have to do part one year out part two year out part three you don't necessarily have but to do it in that do... order you you can, year out part one part two part three or part one part two year out is that allowed yeah i mean so because don't you have to do your year outs within a time frame yeah of your part two so you've got to have so you've got i think 
off the top of my head, so don't no one quote me on this. <laughs> um, you have to have done a year's worth of experience within two years of starting the course for your masters. Yeah. And then for part three, you have to have two years total experience, or one sorry, one year's total experience within two years of the oral exam at the end of the year. So you can go part two. <laughs> this, is, start this is such a confusing set up like whenever i have to explain the route to anyone it's, yeah who doesn't who doesn't already know it it's like okay sit down yeah get a, get a drink well that's it make and yourself it, comfortable and it becomes convoluted in that way but you've got you can do that year out that year experience you have to have before your oral exam can be the year you're doing your part three mm-hmm. as well so that kind of it cuts that bit out instead of having a year before but some courses differ i know some courses want you to do two years within two years so you have to do a year out and then your part three and count that year Oh, right. Obviously, if I'd done that, I'd have been fine because I had a year's worth of experience anyway because I did part-time. If you do an apprenticeship... <laughs> the em- it's so much easier. The emperor employs you, you work for three years, and then you're an architect. I think it's important to understand that there are different routes, and I think it's important as well to understand that even the traditional route has its variations. Different universities have different requirements. Um, and so it's always worth doing your research into all of this stuff but mm. that's kind of a rough he says that's probably a bit like an hour of chit chat but it's a rough kind of guide on what we think to be the pros and cons of doing it in the kind of traditional versus the apprenticeship route yeah and obviously don't take it as us skewing the bias by doing the part one then doing your apprenticeship if it was up to me he'd be Which doing the apprenticeship the do. whole way through <laughs> see i yeah i think the reason i was kind of concerned about doing the apprenticeship for the part one is missing out on that social aspect because it's so important within architecture to kind of i guess the network inside to to have a, a group of people that you can talk to and then to also have the experience learning how to talk to people so having having that experience working in the studio with your course mates seems seems like the really the most valuable part for yeah. me yeah yeah definitely and i've got obviously people that i went to university with that I still stay in touch with today, yeah. you know, and they're from sometimes all employee. walks of life. Yeah, yeah. sometimes employ, so, but they're from all walks of life, different countries, you know, and you won't get that really working in a practice most of the time. Yeah, because what, what I'd get is you, the builders, the engineers, everyone who's already working and then the yeah. clients. And I suppose one last thing to touch on is you're not forced to do that one, two, three or your apprenticeship, you know, six, seven. It's a bit of a pick and mix. You can, yeah, you can pick and mix, but you could also extend the gaps between. Mm-hmm. So, or maybe never go into that. So a lot of people I know never actually, or haven't yet, have yet to go into either their master's or their part three. I know someone who wants to do interior design who only is just doing the part one course. I mean, on that note, there are, there's an interior architecture course at Northumbria university and then there's a top-up course that takes you on to the masters so you could even do that route Mm. but that's a whole other conversation yeah thanks for joining us in episode two if you're listening to this in any podcasting platform please consider leaving us a review if you're watching on youtube like comment and subscribe and consider following us at back to the drawing board ig on our instagram and please consider subscribing to our patreons for bonus content longer episodes and to help build our community and we'll see you next time when we return back to the drawing board Thanks for joining us, um, episode two. Um, if you're watching, there's a lot of M's. Um, 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 um. <laughs>